So today we're going to be talking about invasive species. This is a, a topic that I really hold uh, close and dear. I think it's super important, and it's kind of one of it's one of those things that everyone can make a difference in, uh, whether it be in your own yard or in um, it, even even out and about on public and private lands. So I'll go ahead and uh, get us going here. Oops. <laughs> so. First of all, we're going to cover what is an invasive species. Um, invasive species are organisms that are not native, typically, and uh, that cause some kind of harm to uh, humans or the environment. Typically, it's the environment. Um, and invasive species, really, typically they're from somewhere else. They're from an area that's not... Uh, that's That's obviously not not where they're at and they've came in to this new environment and they've taken it over um, and we're going to talk about invasive species we're going to talk about vectors so a vector is how the species gets there and we have a whole slide on vectors um, that we'll get to this picture right here this is Kogan grass which I'm sure that if you're a Hernando County local you've seen um, you've seen some Kogan grass there it's it's on highway 50 it's on uh, shoal line, it's, it's everywhere. Um, so first up, what is a vector? Um, a vector is the method of invasion. Vectors are ways that, in the, that invasive species are introduced to the environments. These can kind of be split up into two main categories, which are man-made or natural. Natural vectors are things like ocean currents, wind, um, other animals. For instance, let's say a, uh, a bird eats an acorn eats a seed of some kind and carries that seed, it, you know, defecates and leaves the seed, the plant grows. That's a vector. The other category is man-made. So man-made vectors, those are things like ballast water in ships. Um, they are, uh, if, you, if you're shipping, sorry about that, if you're shipping, like shipping containers and there's spiders in the shipping containers and they move, that's a vector. Um, humans introducing things on purpose to try to take care of someone, uh, another, another invasive species, that's biocontrol, that's a vector. Th th there are more vectors than we could ever cover in a class. There are more vectors, I think, than we could cover in a lifetime. Um, but that's just what you need to know. Vectors are ways that, uh, that these invasive species get introduced. You have unintentional, which are things like sea, uh, ballast water in a ship or... Um, shipping containers, things like that, uh, importing food and, and some other uh, little pest that's on the vegetable or fruit that's imported. Those are all unintentional. Intentional vectors typically are biocontrol or ornamental where you're like, oh, I think this looks pretty. I'm going to plant it. And uh, it ends up taking over. Um, so we're going to go over some invasive plants that we see in Florida. Here are three pretty common examples, especially in our area. We have Brazilian pepper tree. We've seen Brazilian pepper tree. Um, if I know with my experience, if you if you haven't seen it, you want to know what it looks like. Wiki Watch Preserves typically got some. Uh, they're it. They have little red berries, and the red berries animals eat them, and that pushes them out. The red berries they fall off really easy. They'll get spread all over the uh, all over the ground and moved around via natural vectors. Um, they're native to South America, as the name suggests, and they can grow in a few different morphs. You have, uh, they can grow in little shrubs too. I've seen 20 and 30 foot tall trees. Um, another one, which is the first picture up here on the, on the right hand column, that's old world climbing fern. Old world climbing fern, it likes to smother. Um, it grows very, very quickly. Um, and it's pretty hardy when it comes to um, like control measures. They're, they're kind, of, kind of difficult to take care of um, when, when you're trying to get rid of it. Um, it also, and one of the big things with uh, these invasive plants is they all have some kind of effect on the native ecosystem. And old world climbing fern, other than smothering, because it, like, um, it grows like crazy. And I have a picture, I think, a little bit later that shows how it's... Uh, like the kind of ground cover that we'll get with it, um, it likes to grow up. So it, it's a climbing climbing fern. It'll grow up to the canopy of these trees and, um, sorry about that, it'll grow up to the canopy of the trees and that creates what's called a fire ladder. So 
when if you have a um, if you have a wildfire or even a prescribed burn that it'll climb that fire will climb up to the top and burn the canopy of the trees now things like pine trees are adapted to be burnt down on their base but around up in the canopy if that gets burned we really can't count on that tree to survive anymore because it's not used to that typically fire doesn't get that tall um, another example is the chinese tallow tree um, they they're everywhere at this point um native to china but they are absolutely everywhere and i've seen people people like them quite a bit it's sort of like camphor trees they're pretty and if they've been in your yard a long time you typically uh you typically don't don't mess with them but the thing is is they are invasive and they propagate very quickly um they are very opp opportunistic so when they have the uh the opportunity to get out and and take over an area they will do it so that's during primary succession which is after uh, some kind of event that wipes away most of your vegetation population, the, they'll be one of the first things that come up and really be dominant um, in that landscape. And this kind of brings us to our next point, which is the treatment methods. And this is kind of what you can do. So um, here in Hernando County, some common things that we'll see are pepper trees on in your property or um, Kogan grass is a big one. And we have a few different methods to... Uh, take care of these invasive species, these invasive plant species. Um, the first of which is a mechanical treatment, which is pulling weeds. You pick them up and pull them up, chop them down. That's, uh, that's physically removing it from the area, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's normally really labor intensive. And if you have a really big infestation, it's not really the, it's not really optimal to do that, to take care of them. Um, another Excuse me. Another example is chemical treatment, and this is typically what you're going to see is one of the most um, efficient treatments. And if used correctly, there's not there's not a whole lot um, of negative effects if you, if you're using it how it's meant to be used. Uh, in our lower picture on the left, that is a treatment method known as hack and squirt, which is a chemical treatment where in a a tree a woody a, a a woody plant you'll cut into the stem or trunk uh very depending on how long it, it makes it easier than just chopping it down but you'll coat that interconnective tissue with a strong herbicide and the plant will really do the work for you carry that herb, herbicide up and down and will uh it'll take care of the plant the last one and one that i think is super interesting is biological control so on our top right up there we have a little bug some kind of uh some kind of insect eating eating a leaf and that's biological control. So biological control is where we'll take, especially with an invasive species, we'll take a natural predator of it and um, introduce that natural predator, which once again, we're going back to our vectors, that's a vector, um, to take care of it. Because one of the issues with invasive species is that they come in and the things that typically keep them under control are not present. And that's why they're able to really get down and dirty with our uh, native native uh, plant population, native animal populations, because they don't have those population controls that you would typically see in their native range. Um, biological control aims to use predators or use biological controls to, to limit those populations and to bring them back down. Um, nowadays, it's really hard to get new biological controls approved um, by the various governing bodies for that type of thing, but that's not without reason. We've had several, many, many um, failed introductions of biological control species that turn into invasive species themselves. One, uh, the biggest example is the cane toad. The cane toad was originally brought over here to control sugarcane pests, and now it's a uh, it's a real big deal. It's a real negative. Um, negative actor on on our local ecology uh really nobody no homeowner no no normal citizen should be trying to uh, apply any biological control methods just because they are so um they are that there's a there's a very high chance that something bad happens and when it's bad it's it's really bad um some of the successful bio control biological control or biocontrol method uh methods we've used we have a for old world climbing fern there's a mite species that pretty much just eats old world climbing fern that one's been been used a few times 
Um, if you're ever in Tampa and you go to the bypass canal, there are carp, uh, triploid carp. They're bred to have a different number of chromosomes, so they cannot reproduce, which is great because grass carp in some areas are incredibly invasive, but these ones, they can't reproduce, so the population stays exactly how big we want it to stay, and we end up, uh, we end up being able to manage those effectively. Uh, those grass carp, they eat, um, I think, water lettuce and uh, hydrilla. So we'll move on to invasive animals, which we, I'm not asking anybody, if, when it comes to your yard, you shouldn't, you need to call, most of the time animals are going to take professionals. So we have, we got that guy looking at us, that, that big dude, that is a feral hog. I'm sure uh, locals are going to be familiar with hogs. They are a scourge on the environment. They were brought over, um, first brought over in like the 16th century by conquistadors that were that had pigs as a food source well when they move on they leave the pigs the pigs go and it turns out that here in the continental u.s is a great place for pigs to live um it has everything they need and they'll root uh root up destroy land and really throw uh the entire ecological balance of the area off and that's that's not good we <laughs> we don't want that um and they've even bred with, um, you, you get all kinds of issues with these hogs, and they're incredibly difficult to take out. Numerous government agencies uh, from Swift Mud, USDA, uh, the EPA, they all have different programs to take care of these hogs. If you see a hog and you need to get rid of it, you should call somebody. Don't, don't, don't do that one on your own unless you're really confident in your abilities. Um, next one up, a cane toad. Now, cane toads... Don't touch them. They are uh, they have a toxin. They're coated in a, a toxic substance that's all on their their glands. They it kind of comes out of them. And cane toads, like I said earlier, they were introduced as a pest control measure for sugar cane pests. But they uh, they really have had a negative impact on our um, native amphibian population. And I they're even known to eat small birds. These guys get pretty big. But the, this is one of the ones that you actually might see in your yard, and, and those, um, you can dispatch them in the way you like. I think the humane way, I was told, is to freeze them, but I wouldn't go touch in a cane toad. Um, and everyone's heard the news stories. Uh, we have pythons down in the Everglades, and those are bad. Uh, those have had a really, really huge effect on the area. If you see a python, definitely uh, call animal control. Call, uh, call somebody. Don't, don't go messing with a python. They tend to eat, uh, they've really took a huge toll on the small mammal population out in uh, down south and even, I mean, they're creeping north the same way that invasive species typically spread until they can't anymore. Um, Florida's warm, Florida's got a lot of water, so they're, they're moving, uh, I guess, be on the lookout not to scare anybody. Um, so, the, and we're going to get now to the effects on the native species because that's something, you know, native plants and native animals are adapted to live here. And they, every, every native plant, every native animal has, has a role to play. They have an effect on the ecology of an environment. And you can never, you can never just, it's, it's like a house of cards. If you take something out, it's all going to fall down. There's really, there's a whole lot of um, domino effect with things like this where you'll, 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 you'll eliminate something that you think is annoying or eliminate something that uh, causes you some kind of issue. And we have to think about the big picture because if you take something out like that, it's going to have um, effects on, on the ecology as a whole for the area. Um, in our examples here, we have, uh, you, you see here in this, this big picture up top, there's a whole lot of old world climbing fern that has really just covered that entire area. And if you notice, those palm fronds on the top left, they're, they're pretty browned out. Uh, I can't really tell. They might be maybe cypress trees in the back. I'm, I'm not sure. But those are defoliated, and they, they aren't looking too good. Well, that old world climbing fern is smothering them. It's, that stuff grows, um, grows huge. And sorry, Charlie, I missed your uh, – I missed your – Comet, they, they're all over the place. Um, I haven't seen any. I've only lived in Spring Hill now for uh, a month and a half or so. But I know that on the 
east side of the county where there's a little bit less development you can see them all the time on state road 50 towards 75 and back past 75 they're all over the place and then um, i'm from sumter county and one of the one of the things it's it's on our wikipedia funny enough where it says uh, a nickname for us is hog county there are so many hogs i've dealt with hogs uh, as long as as long as i've been around but they range those hogs are from uh, I think I think there's been confirmed hog sightings in every county in Florida, and in almost every I know every southeastern state, but I think they stretch out west, up north. They're 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 everywhere. Oh, back to this. Sorry about that. Um, back to the effects on the native species. We have those hogs right there that have really rooted up rooted up an area, and that's that's not great. Um, we already kind of went over some of those effects. They mess with the. The water table, uh, because the water's not going to flow the same way. Um, they really the, the, these roots. I mean, they poop in them, and you get you get all kinds of intrusion from that. Um, on the bottom left, we have a coke and grass monoculture, and I'm sure we all know monoculture. No good. We don't want those. Um, those monocultures tend to push out everything else, and the ecosystem services that we would come to expect from native species in the area will cease. Um, so they spread disease. That's kind of, that's more with, um, animals and plants because a lot of plant diseases are kind of species specific. Um, the big one, the, the huge one is the out competition or out competing native species. That's what, I mean, really that's what, um, that old world climbing plant is doing that. So everything's in competition for resources. There's a limited finite number of resources in every ecosystem and the, since the native plants are adapted to use what's available um, and sometimes not much more, they, the, these new plants that are not adapted to the ecosystem will come in and just take it all. And um, it's almost like a scarcity mindset, if you will, with these um, invasive plants. And they'll, they'll do better, not because they are better plants, but because they're not, they're not, they, they don't fit into the keyhole that the, the native species does. Um, and that's kind of a smothering is a uh, example of our competition we have. And then predation, that's with, um, for instance, with those pythons, they will, they, they, that's why there's no small mammals in the Everglades anymore is because pythons have eaten them all, um, which goes to the owl competition. They eat more than the alligators, so there's less alligators. And the adverse effects to abiotic factors, that's kind of just looking down here at, uh, at that hog that's really tore up that the soil and really made it so that there's not really going to be plants um, growing there. Uh, so when it comes to your yard, and this is kind of going back off the PowerPoint a little bit, in your yard, you're not going to see huge invasions and you're really not going to see, you're not going to see the start of any invasions in your yard. Typically, if you're doing, um, if you're doing what you should, uh, when it comes to getting new plants, there's a list that um, the state of Florida puts out every year that is a little bit different than the um, the national list, and and I'll post a link to that after the class is over. If you're importing the correct plants, you're not going to see an invasion, but you do have to keep an eye out. You need to know what the common invasive plants are, and you need to kind of know what their effects um, know what their effects can be because if you let one go or you keep it because you like it. It may, it may have found its spot in your yard, but it'll spread and it'll cause other issues. So I'm sure that the camphor tree in, in your yard is beautiful, but you really have to consider um, what it can do to the surrounding areas. Um, and, and, and your neighbors really too. So if you have, you, you, might, you may have a beautiful Brazilian pepper in your yard that, uh, that's been there for decades and it looks nice and you love the red berries. But the thing is, is those red berries are getting carried to your neighbor's yards. They're getting carried uh, in your, your whole area, really. And sure enough, you'll have some piece of land that is not managed um, regularly, and it might just be on the side of the road or something. And soon enough, you'll see a huge, um, a huge like tangle of Brazilian pepper tree growing. And uh, well, I'm not blaming you for it. It may be you, you, it's just kind of the things you have to consider when it comes to. Uh, when it comes to invasive species, we really want to do our best to not, well, you should never plant them. It's illegal to transport or purchase them or sell them. Um, but you, you really have to keep an eye out. And if you need to get rid of those legacy invasives, you need to 
um, be on the lookout. And there's a, um, I can't remember, I think it's FWC, but I might be wrong. The, we have a, there's an app by a, some state agency that is, it's called I've Got One, uh, I-V-E-G-O-T, the number one. And I've Got One is a public reporting tool for invasive species where if you see something, you say something. The reporting is a big thing because the uh, agencies can't do anything about it. They don't know. And uh, I'm sure we all know there's, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of land to be covered. There's a lot of public land to be covered. So knowing, and knowing that data, you know, data's king. Um, and to know where it is is to be able to prevent or predict where it's going to go and what we have to do as a society to really keep these uh, the, the, these scourges from uh, from expanding. But uh, that's that's pretty much all I have uh, today. So I will um, I'll throw it back for questions. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask or has any burning questions about Florida friendly landscaping, invasive species, anything I've talked about, anything I'm excited about, I'll, I'll wait for a, uh, for a few minutes. Oh, you're welcome. I, I really, I really enjoy it. One of the, uh, one of the big things I like to do with this is, uh, publicly educate. That's, that's why I'm here. Um, to catch everybody up with what's going on FFL for right now, we have a rain barrel workshop on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a rain barrel workshop on Wednesday, the 25th. Um, that's going to be here at the utilities department. Uh, please go to the link in the Facebook bio or Instagram bio or the link tree link that is displayed right now. I might be, am I having... Kind of worried I might be having some technical issues. I hope I hope not. I'm glad I got through the content anyway. If I didn't, um, we have a rainbow workshop the 25th. That's going to be here. Sign up in at the link in the Instagram bio. I'll be tomorrow. I'll be at the uh, safety and fun fest down in downtown Brooksville. Come see me. Come get some swag and sign up for our newsletter. Um, where if you. If you already signed up and you come up, I'll give you a, I'll give you a bag. But if you haven't, um, we'll have an opportunity to sign up for that and the Rain Barrel class there on Saturday. But that's uh, that's all I've got for the day. I really appreciate everyone listening and uh, coming out to hear me talk about invasive species. And yeah, so I hope everyone has a good day, a good weekend, and I will see you next week. Bye bye.